episode 112 of the Cricket Her Weekly. Now Sid, we've just got a week to go now until the biggest date in this year's cricketing calendar. Yeah, the start of the Charlotte Edwards Cup. I'm really excited, Raf. It's, ne it's next Saturday and it's going to be going to be great. Is there nothing else happening next Saturday? Don't think so, is there? No. Oh, we're getting married. We are. Yay. It's very exciting. Um, and we're hoping that um, even though we'll be busy and we won't be able to record a newsy podcast, we will be able to bring you a very special something else episode. So look out for that. Okay. Anyway, um, in the last few days, um, the Fair Break tournament has got underway. And we talked about it a little bit in last week's forecast, and we're going to talk about it a bit more in this week's forecast. Um, it's been obviously on free to air TV in the UK, so that's been really exciting because we've been able to watch some of the games. Um, obviously, kind of juggling it around work and, and other commitments, but we've we've been watching it a bit. Um, and yes, yeah, it's, it's got underway, um, and there's been some exciting performances. Um, I'm sure that our viewers have been following it themselves, so I won't go through through an entire rundown of everything that's happened so far um, but Sid you've been crunching a few numbers. Yeah so I've been going through the batting and bowling stats and it's kind of interesting um, the batting is very much dominated by the by the big name players so um, all of the top nine batters um, are players that you know that we've all heard of from the, um, the, full, the full member nations so Shmaria Atapatu out at the top who's had a couple of good innings got Danny Wyatt in there um, and you know they're the kind of players that you'd expect to be there. Yeah. It's really that in the bowling where the the associate players uh, have had much more opportunity actually. So uh, full member na nation batters have faced sixty percent of the balls, whereas full full member nation bowlers have only bowled forty percent of the balls. So sixty percent of the balls have been bowled by associate players. Oh, okay. um, so the associate players, um, you know, getting much more of an opportunity to bowl. I guess this kind of fits in a, a little bit with the way that the, the T20 leagues generally work because um, what we've, we see a lot in the tournaments like the 100 Kia Super League going back and the WBBL is that if you want to hire an overseas player you hire a big batter and you put them in up front and you get them to score loads of runs yeah. for you and that's kind of what's happening here as well which means that in some ways it's quite it's a fairly typical tournament it does mean that there's, there's a lot more opportunities being given to those associate nation bowlers than there is to the batters um, and if the purpose of this is to give opportunities to those associate players I think they need to try and find a way of getting more opportunity for mm. those batters because otherwise you're going to get more and more things where especially as people get settled into like the rhythm of the tournament and what the pitch is like out there and you're going to see more things like we saw yesterday you know where you know you, you have a, like Elise Villani able to just go in and carry her bat through the entire innings without really taking any risks um, and kind of almost dominating too much because that's what we want to see we want to see more balanced games I think so yeah. we saw a couple of games in the first week that weren't particularly balanced you know at, uh, because these full member nation batters were able to rack up these mm. huge scores, um, but you know, let, let's let's look at the positives of the tournament. It's been a long time in in the making, as yeah. as we know that um, you know Sean Martin first came up with this idea. You know, we spoke to him like eight years ago or something when yeah. he was first kind of kicking it around, yeah. um, you know, and trying to get this off the ground. It's taken a long time to get there, um, but you know, they've really made it work, and he's made it work, and it's really been very much his drive that has taken it taken it to where it is, you know, and we've got to a point where, you know, they've, they've, they've hired out a stadium and they've done everything right. They've got commentators, they've, they've got proper TV coverage with, you know, decent camera work. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's been broadcast mm. in, uh, all over the world and we've got our free, free view um, option in this country. So you don't have to pay any money. Everybody's got that available to them. Um, it's on channel 64 or 65, depending on what mood your TV in is. <laughs> It is a bit strange the way that the TV channels work in this country. I know yeah. it's the same elsewhere, but they do seem to move around a bit. Of this, those higher channels, you've got like the BBC channels that are always in a particular place, um, but the, the other channels seem to shift a bit. Anyway, but um, you know, a real positive that, that we can watch it under those circumstances. And we've had all the games on. They've been a little bit in the background on occasions. So obviously, we're doing our day jobs, um, but it's been a nice thing to have on in the background, and I've been enjoying it. So. Yeah, it's it's been um, a, a good way to pass the time. I think it's important that we put it kind of in, in the context of these. These are very much really exhibition matches. 
Um, I, I don't think in, in many ways it's a serious competition that, that people are particularly worried about winning. You can sort of see the attitude of some of the players where they're, they're much more relaxed than they would be under mm. normal circumstances. They're perhaps playing shots from the off that they wouldn't play from the off if they were playing in a World Cup or whatever. Um, but, you know, if you treat it like that and you treat it as, you know, the, the, the women's equivalent of it, you know, these, these exhibition tournaments that you sometimes see, or perhaps the women's equivalent of the Abu Dhabi T10, then, you know, there's a lot to be got out of it. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, and they have been a bit mysterious about the prize money, haven't they? I don't think that anyone's said um, what prize money, what the prize money is that's up for grabs or what else they might win. Um, so that's been the kind of interesting one in terms of um, how, as you say, it's perhaps more of a let's show what we can do rather than we're actually in this to win it. Yeah, but I mean, you know, from the players' perspective, they are getting they are getting very well remunerated for this. We've seen we think we've seen what well, we've seen figures banded around. We believe some of the players are being paid fifteen thousand, twenty thousand. We understand that all the players aren't being paid the same. Um, you know, there's obviously some some good money for some of the players there. Yeah, and, no, I think that's kind of. All of the play players are being paid, we understand. So right down the tree, even though they might be getting a bit less money, everyone is being paid for you know their contribution to this this whole thing. Yeah, as you would expect. Um, I just wonder whether, um, just in terms of the money that's that's being paid to somebody like Danny Wyatt, um, who we know has actually um, been, been sitting out some of the games and being kind of swapped back and forth for Susie Bates or whoever, um, purely because um, they want the teams to have more balance and they don't want one team to be totally dominant. Um, they're kind of trying to manufacture that, aren't they? Um, and actually, you know, is it helpful for them to pay, be paying fifteen or twenty thousand pounds to Danny Wyatt to go out there and not play in the matches when that could be being spent on um, on associate cricket? Ultimately, I, I I don't want to be too negative, but um, just just find that a little bit problematic. And would it would it not maybe? I mean, what we're seeing in this tournament is something that we all kind of already knew, which is that there's a huge gulf between standards um, in associate women's cricket and in um, full member tends to be professional women's cricket. Um, obviously, some of the associate countries do have um, what we might term kind of professional contracts, but in terms of on the ground, are they actually able to devote the same amount of time? What those professional contracts looks like varies. Um, but obviously, it's the full member countries um, who have got the bulk of the resources. Um, and so, you know, that's the gulf that we would expect to be there. Um, and this tournament is obviously trying to bridge that gap in a way and trying to narrow that gap. And that's a really important um, and kind of laudable aim. I just I just sort of found myself questioning whether this tournament is actually doing that or whether it's the best way to do that. Um, because if you're shelling out £20,000 to have big name players um, there and sitting on the sidelines and you because you've got so many big name players, understand that the big name players are kind of the draw in terms of sponsors and... Um, and TV coverage and everything like that. Um, is that actually the best way to spend all of this money that Sean Martin has somehow managed to get from somewhere um, and um, you know, is, is now kind of seeking to um, address those gaps in, in this, it, with this tournament? Um, you know, would it not, you know, just think about what 20,000 pounds could do um, in a country like Brazil to grow cricket, women's cricket there. Um, think about how many professional cricketers you could make in a year in Brazil with that sum of money that's being in, instead spent on Danny Wyatt um, flying out to Dubai. I, not to pick on her specifically, it's just because she's been one of the players who I've noticed hasn't played in all of the games and therefore you kind of go, well, was it really necessary for her to be there perhaps? Um, in terms of the overall tournament. It's great for her personally. And of course, if somebody comes along and says, here's £20,000 to come play in our two week tournament, she would not. She would be stupid to say, "Oh no, actually, I have to think about the integrity of associate cricket." Um, but just, just in terms of the bigger picture, I think um, it's really important that we develop associate cricket. I just wonder about some of the the money that's been spent on some of the aspects of this tournament. Um, how, how, whether that could have maybe been invested elsewhere, or you know, perhaps we could have a tournament where there's only one big star player from a full member nation in each of the teams even. Um, and then that would mean that um, you're spending a lot less money on getting those players out there, but you have still got that attention um, of you know the uh, people who are kind of pre-existing full member fans, I suppose. Yeah, and there's, the, there's the, I guess if you're looking at what's the best thing to do for associate cricket overall, I mean, the best thing that can be done for associate cricket in the women's game is to 
invest in things like the under 19 World Cup. And that's coming coming up. Uh, and, you know, the ICC are doing that and that money is going in there to, to create a tournament which is, has a much wider reach in terms of countries um, than anything that we've seen before. So, you know, and this has some little bit of different aims. And, you know, ultimately, in terms of the long term aims of fair break, that's, there's still mm. so, so open questions there. And yeah. There's some contradictions as well, which you should, we should acknowledge, right? That if the long term aim of fair break is to be the best tournament in the world, then ultimately you're not going to get a lot of involvement from, you know, 40 year old Japanese spinners that spent most of their life playing baseball yeah. because they're just not going to be part of it. Because if it's going to be the best tournament in the world, it's going to be dominated by Australians and New Zealanders and English players and, and South Indian. Africans yeah. and Indians. If they can get them. Um, and you know, so th there's, there's a contradiction there that ultimately they're going to need to resolve. But, you know, that doesn't mean that, that, in the in the short term it, it wasn't worth doing and it's yeah. shown that it is possible to build these things it's shown that there is sponsorship money out there to yeah. do these things which the icc have previously you know always gone oh well no we can't find the money for this sorry guys this shows that if you have the, the dedication and the right people in place there is money to be found from sponsors to do things like this um you know and that's really shown up actually some of those other boards i think yeah. so well anything that embarrasses the icc is obviously a good thing <laughs> Okay, anyway. um, so last weekend um, we actually got out on about and we watched some live cricket, didn't we? I think I'd build it in last week's podcast um, as the biggest rivalry in global cricket. We went to see Kent v Sussex and it was a great day, wasn't it, Sid? Yeah, Kent lost two T20 matches. The first That's not why it was a great matches. day. That oh, makes sorry. me sound really anti Kent. <laughs> it was a great day and Kent lost both their games. <laughs> But it was the first T20 matches that Kent have lost since before the pandemic. They yeah. lost a couple of one-day matches in like the the London Championship and things. Um, but you know, Kent a little bit brought down. Uh, didn't have all their top players, yeah. though, did they, Raf? Well, any? Well, yeah. Uh, well, they had Grace Scrivens, of course. Of course. And um, you know, she she had a really good day. So she got like thirty odd in the first game. She was the captain for the day. Um, still only like uh, 19, no, 18, eighteen years old. Um, so you know, still you know young but you know she she looked very comfortable in that role she looked to be you know directing things you know with the maturity that belies her years really yeah. and then she came out in the second game and you know really smashed it yeah um and that's really what we want to see of the, the top players in this competition because they should be smashing it in 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 those kind of circumstances um and she was playing shots all over the ground um you know she wasn't just smashing every ball over cow corner and you know taking advantage of you know rubbish bowling um you know the shots all over the place and um, she was playing a lot of shots that went over the ring. She didn't assume one six, perhaps. There certainly weren't a lot of sixes. Um, but, you know, it, it was a fantastic performance and the kind of thing that, you know, we hope that she's going to be able to bring into the, the more senior domestic cricket she's going to be playing later in the year. Um, I want to mention one other player that I was really impressed by as well before we get on to other things about that day, which is Alexa uh, Stonehouse. Um, so mm -hmm. she only played in one of the games, didn't take any wickets, but I thought that um, left arm fast bowler, um, she seemed to be bowling reasonably rapidly, um, you know, a bit, bit above classic medium pace, certainly for that level. Um, and she's got a contract in the hundreds. She only played, she played one game last year in regionals. Right. Um, so, you know, she, she's not quite a complete debutante, but, um, you know, she's got contracts in the hundred with the Trent Rockets. Definitely one to look out for a bit longer term. That's the joy of watching county yeah. cricket for me, that you see these players and, you know, sometimes nothing comes of them. Sometimes you see a player, um, you know, well, I was talking last weekend about a player that paid for Kent like three or four years ago, a young girl called Chelsea Rosen, um, who, you know, has disappeared off the face of the earth and, um, you know, obviously not, not doing cricket anymore at that level. Um, and she looked really promising. Um, so not all of those players wind up developing, um, but when they do, it's really exciting to see them come through. So look out for Alexis Stonehouse. Yeah, and obviously today is um, the County T20 Cup Finals Day, so there'll be matches going on even as we record this podcast, uh, and they'll be getting underway. Um, so that's exciting. Yeah, we're not going to be there because we're <laughs> we're isolating ahead of ahead yeah, of the big day next Saturday. Day. Um, but we'll obviously be following as much as we can, and we'll look out for any live streams as well. Yeah, what I was going to say was um, though that I think it's a little bit disappointing, given that it's um, Finals Day today, and obviously um, some of these county matches do hold a great. Deal deal of um, importance for um, those who are involved in the county setup. It's disappointing therefore to see that um, it looks like some of the regions are withdrawing and withholding their players from playing in these county matches. Um, there was some stuff about, for example, um, 
George Adams didn't play for Sussex last weekend and of course you've mentioned that Kent were without any of their professional players um, because they were withdrawn by the Stars as we understand it um, for workload reasons. Now to me given the stage of the season that we're at and given the amount of cricket that there is that seems a bit silly um, and it's also um, disappointing to see that regions seem to consider that um, you know what we would think of as fairly meaningless um, inter-regional warm-up matches um, are being prioritised for players to play in over genuinely competitive county cricket. Um, I think that that is partly the fault of the ECB because of the way that they have treated um, county cricket and in particular the T20 Cup has been set up in such a strange way um, that you go okay well maybe some of the um, some of the regions are going you know if you're if you're sunrisers well why would we get our players to play for Middlesex against like Huntingdonshire when they're clearly going to thrash them um, and is that going to be particularly helpful so there's a, a question about the way that, that the county T20 Cup has been set up but I still think it's quite disappointing that in that most competitive group that we see that's got Kent and Sussex and Hampshire and Surrey in all kind of you know your traditional division one counties um, Hampshire obviously latterly so um, that that the regions don't consider that to be a really important kind of warm up for for regionals and and why is that any less um of a of a you know it, well it's a match situation a genuine match situation surely that's better for your players development i i just it just seemed a lose lose thing to withdraw those players um, and i understand that a lot of them won't be playing today even though it is finals day and that's really disappointing yeah and ultimately we need to remember who funds this as well right i mean you know what's the answer to that question who who is going to be funding county cricket going forwards yeah. um you know well it's the counties and will the counties you know want to continue to exactly. fund you know it, if it's made into so much of a, a competition where they can't play you know their big names yeah. and therefore you know they, they feel they can't advertise it in the way that they might do um if they had you know the tammy beaumont's available for kent and that kind of thing yeah Anyway, but we're still, we're still, there's still a lot to enjoy about, you know, what we've got in county cricket. Um, and, you know, we've got some trophies being handed out today and um, look forward to finding out who wins them. I don't know if there are actually any trophies being handed out because I believe that Kent bought their own trophy <laughs> last year. Well, Kent will be handing out a trophy to them. <laughs> themselves um but i don't know if the ecb provides any trophies or if there are any knocking around but like metaphorical trophies. metaphorical trophies. okay now finally this week um there's been an exciting new appointment announced by the ecb um richard bedbrook is going to become the new england women head of performance pathways um so that means that he'll oversee the england women's a and under 19 programs to help develop players ultimately for international cricket um so that's quite exciting now obviously bedbrook's been involved in uh, women's cricket for a very long time hasn't he Sid? yeah he said he uh, sort of came up through the ranks at surrey um so he's a player that's been coaching since he was quite quite young um he he never he was never a you know a, a big professional cricketer no. was he? he never quite made it as a professional cricketer himself uh, but got into coaching uh, started coaching the in the in the sorry women's setup yeah, came was... through into the super league yeah, and now and he... ended up you know one of the key figures across the whole game and it's yeah. really important to uh, I think it's a really important role and it's a re he's a really good appointment for that role isn't he yeah definitely um so he was the when surrey were the kind of pioneering county they appointed him as a full-time coach of the women's county team um before you know um the regional system was you know even the twinkle in claire Connor's eye um he was already a full-time professional coach in in women's domestic cricket um and yeah i think it's a brilliant appointment i think he's a great example of a coach who treats women's cricket with respect and and very seriously and isn't and has never tried to use it as a stepping stone into coaching in men's cricket and those are the coaches who i've got the most respect for um and obviously that that um that prioritisation and, and his commitment to women's cricket has now been recognised by the ECB, so I think it's brilliant. Um, and the players at Surrey and at Stars um, haven't got a bad word to say about him. They all think he's wonderful. Um, and, you know, because he, he works really hard and he is really committed and he's, 
Um, it's been interesting because he took on the regional director role at Stars. Um, and I think we did talk about this at the time um, on the podcast that um, actually that was a bit more maybe of a hands off role than he was used to doing um, because he's so good working one on one with the players and actually kind of developing them in that coaching way. Um, and the regional director role is more of a um, is partly an admin role. Yeah, not, it's a management role. Yeah, management, role, isn't it? That's a better way of putting it. Um, rather than like a pure coaching role. So it's p possible that um, perhaps he's kind of decided to take on this job because um, it is going to be much more of a kind of pure coaching role and really exciting opportunities to, to work with those players in that, in that kind of very um, sort of direct way. Um, and obviously, um, you know, one of the really exciting things about it, I, I think that um, this is actually a new role within the UCB. I did have a look around and I couldn't see that other people had held it. There's obviously in the past, they've had an England Academy head coach and they've had people kind of working specifically within the pathways, but they've not actually had this role before, I don't think. And I think one of the big reasons for creating it is with a view to that under-19 World Cup next year, going, OK, we need somebody who's full time working with that age group of players um, to develop that team. And he's, he's going to be brilliant at that. Yeah, and someone who's got a long term perspective as well, that, that he's somebody that, you know, built up things longer term at, at Surrey. Yeah. And, um, you know, him and, you know, Ebony Rainford Brim working kind of together in, you know, as kind of the figureheads of that women's mm. system at Surrey. Yeah. They were trying to build something long term, something of, of, of like a dynasty, if you like. And that's ultimately what we need. So it's great that there's going to be, you know, an important, respected figure in, in that role going forward. Yeah, so, um, and it's something that I do hope that, I mean, I guess that the real hope is that the IC, that the, IC, the ECB continue this role and that it isn't just something that leads up to the World Cup, but it carries on yeah. forward. And it's something that is a permanent thing to be able to kind of carry on, you know, per, it's permanent revolution, right? Always move the, the, the next generation yeah, in and absolutely. give them the best opportunities and know who to send where. Yeah. And, you know, if you've got someone powerful that can, for instance, go, you know, I'm going to take this person out of here and put them there. And, you know, I'm going to, or I'm going to, go to this 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 region and I'm going to go I think this person needs to be made captain because you know this is someone that we've got our eye on it's, it's being able to kind of be a big enough figure to actually take those decisions yeah. and go to people and tell people what to do that's quite interesting because you're saying that he's going to have authority over the regional director well he'll have some sort of, he'll have definitely um, a degree of moral authority to be able to do that I would say you know there, there might not be anything he might not actually have a, a sort of role where he goes well I can I order you to do this he's not, but that's, really that's not that person. kind of guy no but whereas he is the kind of guy that can go you know, nudge, nudge, wink, you know, not a wink, wink, but nudge, nudge. I think that, you know, we're looking at this person and maybe being England captain in 10 years time. Can you can you look to make this person vice captain next year and then maybe captain the year afterwards of your original yeah, team? I think what you're so, saying is that the hope is that this role is um, the start of the ECB having a more holistic approach to women's cricket, whereby the... Um, the head coach of the England team works with the works with Richard Bedbrook in this new role and then also works with the regional directors and coaches and that it all kind of works together to yeah. produce players. And if we're going to compete with Australia, that's the sort of holistic system that we need, isn't it? Absolutely. OK, well, I'll finish by saying the thing that I tweeted, which is that Surrey's loss is England's gain. <laughs>